So today's lecture is about linear models. Um, to put that in context, this is what we talked about last time, the uh, basic recipe for machine learning. Turning the volume down a little bit. There's a slight echo. Can you still hear me? All right. Um, just put your hands up if I uh, stop, uh, start mumbling or anything. Um, so this is what we talked about on Monday, right? The basic recipe for machine learning. You have some problem that you want to solve. You abstract it to one of the standard tasks. Uh, today we're just going to talk about supervised learning, so just classification and regression. Uh, you have to you know, choose your instances, choose your features. Today we're not going to talk about that. We're going to assume that somebody has done that already. We have some features, we have some instances. We have some instances, we have some features. And then you have to choose a model class. And today we're going to talk about the model class of linear models. And I'll go into that uh, in depth, what that means. And then you have to search for a good model. And these linear models, they're pretty simple, so we won't talk about that very long. Uh, most of the lecture, actually, we are going to talk about specific search methods. And these are very important search methods because they are not specific to linear models. They are search methods, that's what search methods that will come back again and again um, and that we're going to build on throughout the rest of the course. But we introduce them in the context of linear models because linear models are so simple and hopefully that'll give you a chance to understand it uh, immediately. So this is the plan for today. Uh, we start with a little bit of notation, which is basically how do we define what our data set is, how do we write that down in mathematical language, how do we write down these uh, linear models in uh, mathematical language. Then we're going to look at a few simple search methods, just to sort of gradually uh, go into this idea of searching for a good model. Building up to the most important search method of all, which is called gradient descent. And that's really where we want to get to. That's really, the these days, the major search method that a lot of modern machine learning is built on. Almost all of it, I would say. Um, and we're going to do all of this in the context of regression, because that happens to be, for this case, the easiest way to explain it. So then at the end of the lecture, we will talk briefly about how this translates to classification. Um, which is a little bit more tricky, um, but, but very important. And basically all of this is going to come back a lot, especially the, uh, these last two. Um, so if after today you don't quite understand what I've been talking about, uh, for this lecture specifically, I recommend coming back to it occasionally, or if you have some time reviewing it, uh, because it's, uh, most of the stuff we, uh, you'll see today will come back a lot. But let's start simple with a running example. This is uh, just a very simple data set, regression data set. We have one feature, x, a numeric feature, and one target value, y. So given some x, possibly some new x that is not in the data set, we want to predict what y is going to be. If we plot the feature space here and the model space here, then we uh, get this scatter plot. Um, so let's start with the notation to describe this. Uh, basically, uh, our data set we describe as X, and the specific instances in our data set we will, within this course, we will use a superscript. So instance one is X1 superscript, instance two is X2 superscript, and so on. And the corresponding values, the things that we want to predict, we will call Y. Um, and we will match them by this superscript. So the value y corresponding to the instance x is uh, one. Um, if you start looking at the literature, the blog posts, other machine learning resources, this may change. There is no consistent uh, notation. And I hope I can keep the notation consistent within this course, but even that might not be possible. So I'll do my best. Uh, one more thing that's worth saying about this kind of notation, this kind of superscript uh, thing, it's a little ambiguous, because this might also mean x squared, right? So you write that in the same way. Um, 
practically, usually you can tell from context which one I mean. Uh, there are some people who uh, prefer this kind of notation for if you don't uh, use, for if you're not uh, uh, using a square. Um, but I think it's kind of ugly, the extra brackets make it very hard to read. And doesn't really solve the problem because this technically this still solve this still means could still mean x squared. Um, so we'll go for this. Usually we will look at one instance in isolation, and we will just drop the superscript. So there's no problem. So let's look at the linear model. So we have this space. This, we have these x's and these y's, and we want to map one to the other. And we want to do so using a linear model, which is a fancy name for drawing a line. Mathematically, that looks like this. You may have seen this in, in high school already. This is just a function that describes a line. So we have two parameters, w, b. We tend to put these in the subscript of the function. So this is just the name of the function, f, w, b. We have these two parameters, and one of them we multiply with x, and one of them we add to the result. And basically, the effect, the line that you're drawing if you do this, looks like this. So it has a, a, an angle, a slope which is defined by how much it goes up if we take one step to the right. And that value is called w, which is what we call the slope or the angle. And then there's a, a point um, how, high the line, how, how high the line is uh, at when x is 0, so basically how much we translate it up. And we'll call that b, b for bias. w for weight, b for bias. It's not very intuitive phrases, but it's the best we, uh, best we have. Um, and so these two numbers together describe a line. And now we can say, well, given some data, which two numbers, which w, which b, gives us a line that fits this data the best. But as I mentioned uh, Monday, machine learning is not about finding a model for a specific number of features. In machine learning, we tend to think of a data set as having some arbitrary number of features. Whatever approach you come up with has to work, whether you have four features, eight features, 10 features, even a million features sometimes, it all has to work. Um, so we have to generalize this to an uh, arbitrary number of features. So let's do it step by step. Let's start with two features. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, so we have one feature. We uh, have this formula. So for two features, we just add, uh, we just use two weights, one for each feature. We multiply w1 by x and w2 by x2, and then we add one b. And the effect is basically this. So here is our, um, this is the best I could draw in uh, Keynote in 3D. So I hope this is, it's clear what's happening here. Basically, we have this feature space, x2 and x1 are two axes. And we can move in the direction of x2. We can move in the direction of x1. And basically, w1 tells us how much we move up if we take one step in the direction of x1. In this case, w1 is a negative number because we're moving down. And w2 tells us how much we move up if we move in the direction of x2, uh, which is a positive number because we're moving up. And then b, as before, tells us how much we uh, translate this whole thing up and down at the, at the origin. So you get these two lines which together span a plane. So this function describes a plane which assigns a value to every point in this feature space. So now the next step, more than two features. Uh, first, a little bit of notation before we look at the model. Uh, so if we have more than two uh, features, if we have multiple features, it's, uh, what we tend to do is represent each instance as a vector. Uh, most of you will have done some linear algebra, so this should be familiar, but just to go through the basics, um, our notation for a vector on the, uh, in print is a bold letter. So bold x is a vector. Anything that's bold is a vector. We index it the same way, which is now no longer ambiguous because the square of a vector isn't really defined, so we don't have any trouble here. Um, and uh, if we have m features, then we just arrange them in a vector like this. So this xj1 is the value of feature 1 for instance j. That's how we arrange it. And map to each of these is still a single value. So you notice here that the 
Ys are not bold because the Ys are still scalar values. They're still numbers. So this is how we represent our instances. And again, we usually drop the superscript if it's not, uh, not necessary. And we extend, uh, well, as you might expect, we extend the linear model from a plane to a hyperplane by just assigning a weight uh, to every feature and keeping this single B value, which we add on to the end to translate everything. So it's very, very straightforward, just a generalization of what we've been doing so far. Um, but there's a more compact way of writing this down using a dot product. So basically what we do here, we arrange these features into a vector called bold x. We arrange the weights also into a vector called bold x. The weights become a vector, the features become a vector. And then this whole function can just be expressed as the dot product of w and x plus b. Uh, so just to go into this dot product because it comes back a lot. Help you have the bulk of the latecomers. Uh, just to go into the dot product because we've, uh, we're going to talk about it. we're going to use this a lot. Dot product is a very simple operation on on two vectors of the same length. You can write it like this, or you can write it like this. Uh, the one on the left is just matrix multiplication. If you flip one vector and you multiply it by another vector, then you basically get the dot product. So this is not a special operator. It's just the transpose of this vector times this vector which is why I like this, uh, this notation, but sometimes you see this with just the dot. And all the dot product is doing for two vectors of the same length is it's multiplying the corresponding elements and then summing the result. So you multiply wi by xi and then you sum the result, which is basically this bit what we're doing here. Uh, there's a slightly mysterious correspondence uh, that allows you to express the dot product in another way. You can also express the dot product as the length of the two vectors in space, so, uh, not the, the number of elements in it, but the length of the arrow, times the cosine of the angle between them. Sadly, I don't really have time to explain why this is the case. It's quite nice, if, it's quite nice to go through it and figure it out. There's a link in the slides if you want to uh, sort of revise this from your linear algebra. I recommend doing that, but for now, take my word for it, this is true, these values are the same. And most of the time we will think of the dot product as the top, uh, the top value. And occasionally we will refer to the bottom, uh, the bottom expression. A uh, little sidetrack, there's an even more compact way to express this. If you really want to make it super compact, you can also get rid of the b by folding it into the x. Uh, which you get if you do this. So if you put the b at the bottom of the uh, w vector, of the weight uh, vector, parameter vector, and you put a 1 at the bottom of the uh, feature vector, and you take the dot product of both, then you can uh, you get the original expression, so you get the same uh, model that we saw earlier. Um, if you don't quite see this, then try it on paper. It, it uh, works. Uh, usually we don't express it like this, but this exposes a, a, an interesting principle at work here, which uh, we make, which we will come back to a couple of times next week. Namely that if you take a very simple model, you can make it more powerful by adding features. So sometimes if your model is not powerful enough, you can do two things. You can make your model more powerful, or you can add some features. And by adding one feature here, which is just always a one, we've actually made this model more powerful. So that's just a way of thinking about, uh, about uh, models, and that's one thing that we're going to do to make these linear models more powerful than they are. But for now, let's just see how linear models work in isolation and stick with the, uh, the other notation. So that's the basics of notation. This is how we write down a linear model in algebraic terms, in mathematical terms. So now we need to search for a good model. We have a data set. We have a way to write down our model. We have a set of parameters that defines which model we've chosen. Now how do we, which numbers do we pick for these parameters so that the model fits our data? We need two things, we need a loss function, and then we need a way to search the space of all models for a value that minimizes that loss function. 
So that's what we're going to do next. <coughs> uh, we've seen the loss function for regression already, but I'll go through it again uh, a little more slowly. It's called the mean squared error loss. And what you do is you draw a certain line. And for every point in your data, you look at your model prediction and your actual value. You look at the distance between the two. You square that distance. You sum all of these. Uh, that's called a residual, inc uh, incidentally, that distance between the two. So you square all these residuals, and then you sum them. And that, that value is your loss. So the lower that value is, the better your model is which sort of makes sense. If you think of these as rubber bands, they sort of pull on the line, and the more they've pulled the line towards the points, the better the line is. Uh, and this is what that looks like mathematically. So you take the difference between the output of your model and your given output, you square it, and you sum it over your whole data set. Uh, oh, and in this case, I'm not really consistent here, but it's mean squared error loss. So you take the average of these uh, sums, so you divide it by the size of your data set again, it practically doesn't really matter whether or not you do that, because if you minimize the sum, you also minimize the mean. So sometimes this might disappear if I forget to put it there, or if, I, if it's easier to, to use a sum instead of a mean. Practically, it doesn't matter, because the minimum is at the same, uh, at the same model. Uh, and for our linear models, the mean squared error loss looks like this. We just fill in the parameters here when we fill in the model here. So uh, wt over j over xj of wt, the dot product of wt and xj plus b. You subtract the given value, you take the squares, etc., etc. Um, so a little bit more about why we use these squares, why we square these values. Uh, we talked already about it a little bit last time, that you don't want them, uh, you don't want positive and negative values to cancel out, right? We have a big value here and a big value here. If you don't square them and just sum them, this one is going to be uh, this one is going to be negative. This one is going to be positive, and they will cancel out. And you think, well, I'll have a small loss, but actually you have lots of very big residuals. So you don't you want to use the absolute value of the residuals. They think, well, why the square then? Why not the absolute value? Because you could just take the absolute value here. Um, well, for one thing, the square is easier to differentiate, which we're going to get into once we start talking about gradient descent. Um, but it also has this effect. So here's a visualization of what we're actually doing. We're looking at these residuals, and we're taking the square, literally taking the square. So the surface area of this thing is the square of the residuals. And what the mean squared error is doing is it's summing the surface area of all these squares, and the smaller that is, the better your model is. Which means that when you're looking for a model, uh, this residual weighs a lot more than these residuals, or even these residuals. So this residual is twice as big as this one, but in terms of your loss, it weighs four times as much. So that's just a way of saying mean squared error loss really uh, puts an extra penalty on these kinds of outliers. It really puts extra penalty on the really big outliers, uh, on the really big residuals, um, which sometimes you want, sometimes you don't want. It's just a property of the loss function. Uh, but that's why uh, that's that's what that square actually does, which is related to nor <coughs> to uh, assumptions about normal distribution. We'll talk about that in the probability lecture when we'll start talking about uh, distributions. But for now, this is what the square does. This is how it works. So now we have a loss function, which we're going to try and minimize by picking our model parameters. Uh, just a little reminder of the two important spaces of machine learning. We have our feature space where we look at our data. We have our model space where we look at our models. And every point in model space is a uh, model. So it's a f the feature space here is just this line because we're doing regression. We have a one-dimensional feature space. Um, yeah, so we have this model space here where every point is a model that we might choose. And then we have to search this model space for a low value, low loss value, which gives us our loss landscape. So basically, this is our model space. For every point in our model space, we color it black if it's a high loss, white if it's a low loss. And the task of machine learning, the task of fitting a model to our data, is just a task of finding in this picture the brightest pixel. 
the brightest point in this lost landscape. And this is specific to this data set that I showed you earlier. So a simple two-parameter model through this data set has its optimum uh, here at these two parameter values. And now we have to find them. Um, and that process is called optimization in generic terms. So basically finding the optimum of a function, either the maximum or the minimum. And the way loss functions are constructed, we, all, we know it's pretty much always a minimum. So for us, we're, it's always minimization, but the general term is optimization, which is just saying we have this function, in our case the loss, it has a parameter p, so find me the argument, the value of p such that this value is minimized, and we call that p hat. Just uh, a sort of general name for what we're doing here. So let's start with a very practical and very simple example called random search, which basically works like this. You start with a random point in the model space. You just pick a random point, doesn't really matter. And then you go into a loop. You pick another point, P prime, very close to P. You compute the loss for both of them. And if the loss for your new point is better than the loss for your old point, you switch to the new point. You P prime becomes P. And then you do the same thing again, and again, and again, and again, and hopefully you start sort of going down into this lost landscape. There's a common analogy for this kind of process in most search processes, which is a hiker in a snowstorm. So basically imagine you're hiking in the mountains, uh, and you're trapped on the top of a snowy mountain. Suddenly there's this sudden snowstorm, and you can't see a thing. You can't see a thing in front of you. And what you want to do is basically get out of the cold, get out of the snowstorm, get down to the valley where your hotel is, or failing that, just get to lower ground, as low as you can find. Uh, so what you do, basically, you can't see. So what you do is you take a few steps in every direction, and you figure out where the mountain, the slope of the mountain, is going up the most. And you think, well, OK, it's going up in that direction, so I take one step in that direction. And you do the same thing again. Uh, now it's going up in that direction, so I take a step in that direction. And step by step by step, you walk down the mountain, hopefully. The takeaway here is that when you look at this picture, that I showed you earlier, when I said find the brightest point in this picture, you might go, well, it's very easy, it's over there. Uh, but the reason we can do that is because we have a visual cortex that is highly optimized for processing 2D images. We can see the whole landscape at once and evaluate the whole landscape at once. And in normal machine learning settings, this is not a two-dimensional space, this is a million dimensional space, for instance. So you can't see the whole picture at once. You can only see, usually, well, it depends on the problem, but in the cases we're looking at now, you can only see one point of the space in isolation and only compute the loss for one point at a time. So hence, you're like a hiker in a snowstorm. Uh, so I said close to, we need to make that a little bit more specific. So let's start with a simple definition of close to. We just like this hiker in a snowstorm, pick a random, uh, a fixed distance, a random direction in a fixed distance. So we take a small step in a random direction of a fixed distance. So we have m here, m prime. Uh, it's been inconsistent with my naming, so this should be p. Go to p prime. If it's better, you switch to it, and you pick a new point, m prime, switch to that, and so on. Uh, so here's what that looks like if you uh, if you do it. So we start in the bottom left, uh, or in the bottom middle, uh, sorry, left middle. And as you can see, I don't know if it's visible on this. Oh, it's a little bit difficult to see here, but it's taken a few random steps, which were unsuccessful, which were in directions where the loss got bigger until it found this random step where the loss got less. And then repeats and repeats and repeats, and it finds this valley, and then along this valley it starts crawling to the, broadly, the, the minimum. Uh, you can also plot for each point of this, you can plot the model that it's considering at that moment, and see if the model sort of converges nicely, so that looks like this. This is our starting model here, at the bottom, in the light, gray, uh, light blue. And as you can see, it sort of clo uh, slowly, step by step, fixes the angle and fixes the, the bias. 
Um, so already with such a simple, simple principle, such a simple idea as random search, already we're getting a pretty good model. We're getting pretty close to a good model. And one of the reasons that that works so well is that we have a convex loss surface. The convexity just means uh, basically uh, something is convex when it's shaped like a ball. So our loss surface is shaped like a ball. Mathematically, we define convexity as saying if you put, if you draw, uh, if you pick two, uh, any two points on the loss surface, you draw a line between them. Uh, then the surface has to be below that line at every point on the line. If that's true, then your function, your loss surface, is convex. And if your loss surface is convex, you can prove that there is only one minimum. So that if you found the minimum, you know that it's a global minimum. You know that there's not some other minimum somewhere uh, that is lower than this minimum. It's not always true. Sometimes your loss... Uh, for, uh, uh, your loss landscape is not convex. So here's a, a slightly more complex loss function, not for any specific data set. I just plotted some function that I found on the internet. And this function has multiple minima. So this function is definitely not convex. Uh, this is the global one. This is the point where globally, if you look at all the possible points, it gets the lowest. And these two guys here are what we call local minima. So in their direct neighborhood, they are the lowest point. But if you compare them to the whole uh, space, then there is a point that is lower. And the reason that's important is that if you try and do random search on this kind of uh, loss curve, uh, loss landscape, what you can see is that random search sort of beelines to one of these local minima and then stays there. Because it does these random steps and says, well, landscape increases in every direction, so I'm at the lowest point I'm going to find. So I'll just stay here and move around here a little bit. Um, so sometimes you don't want this. Sometimes, sometimes this is fine, sometimes this is a fine solution, but sometimes you really want to escape these kinds of local minima and find a global minimum. And this, a very simple way of doing that is our second search method, uh, an extension of random search called simulated annealing. And basically what we do in simulated annealing is we do the same thing as in random search. So we do these random steps, see if uh, next position is better than the other position. We move to, uh, if so, then we move to the new position. If it's worse, then with a small probability, we still move to the new position. So we basically give ourselves a small probability P of moving uphill in the hope that we can move uphill a couple of times and then down to a better minimum. So if you look at uh, what that looks like on our more complex loss uh, surface, it looks like this. So you see a sort of slightly more jittery search that moves around every little minimum that it can find. And it spends a long time in this local minimum here. But then after a while, it does jump out and then it does find the global minimum. Of course, it might jump out of the global minimum again because we have this random moving uphill. So it might jump out if we let it run for long enough, move to one of these other minima or move back in. Uh, so when you do simulated annealing, usually you remember the best position you've seen. So you keep one sort of model in memory, which is the best model you've seen up to that time. Um, but that's basically not usually a big problem. I do have to mention at this point that uh, this local global minima thing is not always a problem. You're not always looking for the global minimum. Uh, specifically in machine learning, so let's say if you have a very complex model, like a decision tree uh, regression, which we saw in the, the last lecture, uh, they can fit the data perfectly, so they're usually overfitting. So you're, in that case, your global minimum is a bad solution because it's fitting the data perfectly. So we'll say more about that later, but um, for now, let's just say this is a consideration and you might want to be able to escape global minima at least a little bit, but you're not necessarily always looking for the global minimum. Uh, so I instantiated this algorithm with this uh, fixed step in a random direction. You can do other things as well. So this is a fixed radius, fixed step in a random direction. 
You can do random uniform. So you, within this radius, you pick a, a uniform, you pick a point, which might be very close to your starting point or very far away, which gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility. Or even better than that is to choose uh, your step from a normal, uh, normal distribution so that the bulk of the steps you choose are going to be within the circle, but occasionally, every now and then, you might take a step outside the circle. Just to show you that looks like this. So what you see here is that all the false steps it takes, all the uh, failed steps it takes, have lots of different sizes. And in theory, this, even if you don't do simulated needling, this might, in theory, allow you also to jump out of a local uh, minimum. Because in theory, every size of step is possible with a, a normal distribution. But mainly what you see here is that once it gets to the minimum, it's, uh, it's much better at sort of focusing in on, th on the exact minimum than this fixed step size was. Anyway, so that's random search on a continuous space. So we have a continuous model space here. Between every two models, there's an infinity of other models. Uh, sometimes you have a discrete model space, like this classifier that I talked, uh, sorry, like this decision tree um, regression or decision tree classifier that I talked about. These are, every model is a discrete unit and you can add a node or remove a node, but there's not an infinity of models in between those two models. So that's what's called a discrete model space. Uh, you can apply random search th there as well. All you have to do is uh, figure out this kind of transition function. So what I've done here, looking at these trees, I've connected every tree that can be, um, you can get to this tree by removing one node, from this tree to this tree, by removing one node, or you can get to this tree, from this tree to this tree by adding one node. So I call that a connection. And once you have that kind of transition function, then you can also apply random search to a discrete model space when you're searching for trees. So summarizing what we're talking about, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, optimization methods, random search, simulated kneeling, are called black box optimization methods, which basically means that the, the loss function, the model and the loss function are a black box, and you don't need to know what's inside it. All you need to do is compute that and get a loss function for a particular model, and then you can apply it. So these are very generic models that you can apply to almost anything and that are computationally also very efficient, easy to paralyze, very simple to implement, um, but it can take a long time for them to converge to a good model. And another benefit, they work for discrete model spaces. It's also nice. Um, so one, uh, another thing you can do with these uh, random search uh, methods is to paralyze them to search, to have multiple searches going on at the same time. So the simplest thing to do is literally that. So just spin up 10 instances of random search and let them search at the same time. And then hopefully one of them will hit the global, mi the global minimum and you just pick that one. Uh, a slightly more, oh yeah, this is, um, doesn't make a lot of sense to do this with simulated kneeling because with simulated kneeling, you can just let it run. Uh, let's say if one of these ones takes 1,000 iterations. Um, with simulated kneeling, there's not much difference between running 1,000, uh, sorry, running 10 instances in parallel for 1,000 steps or running one instance for 10,000 steps. You get about the same solution. Um, but for random search, you get very, you get a different solution because you are more likely to, uh, to find the global optimum. Um, so it's a very simple way to parallelize. Uh, a slightly more complicated ways uh, are usually, uh, you usually end up with something called population methods, uh, where you have this population of searches going on in parallel, but occasionally you allow them to communicate, to basically share between them what they found and say, okay, there's a good option here, let's all converge here. Um, and usually these uh, search methods or optimization methods are inspired by something you find in nature. So there's uh, particle swarms, ant colony optimization, 
And probably the most popular one is evolutionary al algorithms. So these are search methods inspired by evolution. So I'll finish up, I think, with uh, just a brief, a very brief glimpse at how, uh, how that works. So here's a very basic algorithm. They don't all look necessarily exactly like this, but this is sort of a, a, a most basic form of an evolutionary algorithm in the context of what we're doing today. So instead of starting with a simple model, a single model, sorry, you start with a population of models, so you get a set of models together. Just pick some randomly, doesn't really matter. And that's your population. And for each of them, you compute the loss, and then you rank them. And the half of the population that has the worst loss, you kill them, you just remove them. And the top half, you breed them. You make children, basically. So you make a new population of K models that are in some way defined by the properties of the old population. And that's something you have to instantiate. You have to decide how, that, how to do that for your problem. Usually, since it's inspired by evolution, you pick two parents from the old population at random and you somehow cross them to make a new one. But that's, you have a lot of flexibility there. And it also may help to add a little noise to each child, so just, just to tweak something at random, uh, to add some variation to the population that's uh, called mutation. Um, so to instantiate this algorithm for our situation, let's just say that we, uh, we do this as it says here, and then when we breed, when we create a new uh, child, we just pick two random parents, and the new model is the model halfway between the two. So we draw a line between these two parents in model space, we pick the halfway point and we add a little noise, and that's our new, uh, our new model. So it looks like this. We start with the population of models, both the red and the green points. Uh, the red ones are the worst half, the ones that we kill. And the green ones are the best half. As you can see, they're closest to the uh, optima. So these are the ones that stay alive. And then we breed, as I said, by drawing a line between random parents, adding a little noise, and that becomes the plus. The plus is our new population, the children. And then we do the same thing again. Uh, we kill the top half, uh, sorry, we kill the half with the worst loss. And this is what that looks like if you iterate it. We start out with this random cloud of points and they slowly start moving towards all the different optima. And then after a while you see that the optimum, the global optimum sort of wins out and here the population, uh, one step from the end, the population is spread over these two minima that it can find, and then one step later you see that it's actually converging to the global optimum. So that's a basic evolutionary method, um, which is a very powerful method, also a black box method. You only need to compute the uh, optimum, uh, the loss function, sorry. It's very easy to parallelize, so it's easy to run on multiple computers. Very nice uh, property. But it can be slow and expensive for, uh, uh, for complicated models because you have to compute your loss function for every single uh, agent element in your population. So you have to, uh, for every iteration, every step, you have to compute your loss function k times, which can be expensive. And you have all these hyperparameters and these things that you have to tune and you have to decide how to breed a population and how to add noise, how much noise to add. So uh, it's a little bit more difficult to implement because you have much more choices to make. Um, so that's the end of the black box uh, methods that I wanted to talk to you about. So just as a little stepping stone to gradient descent, which we're going to talk about after the break, we'll look at one more search method, uh, which doesn't have an official name, so I've, I've decided to call it branching search, which is another very simple variation. We, again, we so back to random search. Uh, start with a random point. But now, instead of picking a single random direction, we're doing what essentially what this uh, hiker in a snowstorm was doing. We're picking multiple directions at the same time. And then over that set of multiple directions, we find the direction with this uh, lowest loss. So instead of picking one random direction, we pick k random directions and minimize over those. That's all we're doing. So. Um, and now we can look at this parameter k and see what happens if we 
vary this parameter. So if we spend a little bit more time exploring the space around us before we pick our direction, what happens? So for K2, we get basically the same thing we saw earlier with random search. What you see here is that it really spins away from the minimum before it starts getting anywhere near. And as we saw with the K1, eventually it sort of randomly finds its way to this valley and then starts going for the minimum. But as we increase, so if we go for K5, we spend a little bit more time investigating our local uh, curvature, our local surroundings. We get a more direct line towards the optimum. And then K15, we really go along the curve of the loss surface exactly right down to the minimum. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the question here is, is uh, yeah, so this is a fixed length algorithm, of a fixed, uh, fixed step size. Uh, would it make sense to use this random step sizes again? Um, yeah, I'm sure it would. It, it, I'm sure it would be better. Uh, but for now, this, is, um, this gives us a better analogy to what we're going to do later, gradient descent. Um, so what we've seen here, well, to escape local minima, we have to add this randomness or add multiple models. But if we want to converge faster, well, we can do this evolutionary search. We can uh, combine known good models, but we can also inspect the local neighborhood more thoroughly. So instead of taking this random step, we can have a look at what the local neighborhood is doing, uh, what's happening in the local neighborhood, and really spend a lot of time working out this, this optimal direction before we take a step in that direction, instead of just picking a random step. Um, and the good news is, what we're going to talk about after the break, is that we can do this very efficiently. We don't have to take lots of random samples. We can actually, if we know the function that we're dealing with, so we're moving away from black box optimization a little bit, we can compute from the function very efficiently the direction in which the function goes down the quickest, which is called the gradient, which brings us to gradient descent, and that's what we're going to talk uh, about after the break. So let's have a quick break. I'll see you in 15 minutes, and then we'll pick up with gradient descent. <laughs> so where we left off, just to remind you, or if you just came in, uh, where we left off, we uh, looked at these um, search methods that are a way to explore the loss surface, which helps us find a good model, which is a low point in the loss surface. Uh, and we looked at a lot of ways of taking random steps and uh, then constantly looking at the loss surface to find the lower, lower and lower and lower space. And the conclusion that we ended up with is the better you understand, the more you understand about the space locally, the, the space where you are, uh, the more informed you can make a decision about which direction to go. And the extreme end of that is uh, gradient descent, which we're going to talk about now. Um, which, uh, what we have to give up for uh, all the good stuff that we get for gradient descent, what we have to give up, give up is that it's no longer a black box model. What we're going to do now is we're going to actually look at this loss function, and it has to be continuous, it has to be smooth, and it has to be differentiable. And we're going to use a little bit of calculus to find, uh, to compute exactly the direction in which that function uh, decreases the quickest, goes down the quickest. Um, so a little bit of revision of uh, uh, calculus. Um, uh, if you find this difficult, if it's been a very long time since you did calculus or if you've never done any calculus before, um, well, first of all, what I s when I say calculus, I just mean finding derivatives. It just means, uh, or the uh, afgeleide name, as we say in Dutch. Uh, that's what I call calculus. Um, so if you've never done that before, uh, have a look at the homework, the second homework exercise. Uh, there's a pretty extensive uh, tutorial type introduction. Well, uh, also the first homework exercise. So have a look at both the first homework exercise and the second homework ex exercise. Uh, and you can sort of test if you have the right level of knowledge about calculus, if you remember enough from calculus. And then there's some links to help you out if you don't. Uh, for now, I'll just review a couple of uh, ideas very quickly. So we've seen this already. If we have a line defined by a 
a slope and a bias, a weight and a bias, then the slope tells us how fast that line goes up if we take one step to the right. So if the slope is negative, the line is actually going down if we take one step to the right. Uh, <clears throat> and if the slope is positive, we're going up. Um, so we're going to talk about slopes again. We're going to talk about these kinds of functions. Uh, but now we're not talking about the model, but we're talking about the loss function. So that's, that might be confusing, uh, but try and keep these things separate. We're talking about slopes in relation to the loss uh, curve, which is not linear. So these, it's, it's the, uh, uh, our loss surface is not described by this kind of function. But what we can do if we have a loss surface uh, and we're interested in how it behaves at a certain point, we can find the line, if we think of it as a one-dimensional loss surface for the time being, we can find the line that just touches it at that point, that just overlaps with it at only one point, and that point's the point we're at currently. Uh, that's called the tangent line. And the slope of the tangent line is our derivative. So if this is a function and we have access, we know what this function looks like, we compute the derivative of this function and evaluate it at this point, what we get out of it is the slope of this line. And what the slope tells us, what you can see from this picture, you know, this is where we want to end up at the minimum. What the slope tells us, uh, well, the sign of the slope tells us in which direction we want to move. In this case, the slope is negative, so we want to take a step downwards. Uh, and the slope also gives us an indication of how quickly we want to move. So if the slope is very big, the function is moving down very quickly, so we can take a very big step. And once we get to the minimum, the slope will start to, slope of the tangent line will start to flatten out, will start to get smaller. So we'll want to take smaller steps as well. So we'll take big steps here, and then slowly and slowly, slowly, here we want to take smaller steps. So it's sort of already hinting at how gra what gradient descent might look like. Uh, but this is only one dimensional. We need to translate this to more dimensions because our model space is usually high dimensional. So the equivalent of doing this in more dimensions, of finding this tangent line, is finding a tangent hyperplane. So if you have a, a two dimensional uh, loss surface here, the, th the linear thing that touches it, tu sorry, the linear thing that touches it at only one point. Is, called, uh, is a plane in this case, and that's called a tangent uh, plane. And in more dimensions, it's difficult to visualize, but it's basically a tangent hyperplane. Um, so that's what we're looking for. We're looking to find, if this is our loss curface, uh, surface, we are looking to find the tangent hyperplane which will, from which we'll be able to derive in which direction uh, the uh, loss surface uh, decreases the quickest because that's the direction in which this plane decreases the quickest. quickest. Um, so now another preliminary we need to deal with is uh, how to interpret vectors. So we've so far interpreted vectors mostly as just a bunch of numbers arranged in a row. Uh, and they can be a point in space. So x is this point in space. Three to the right, one up. That's this x. But you can also think of it as a direction. So this vector represents this direction. Uh, so that's just a, a two ways of thinking about vectors, either as a point in space or as a direction. Um, and of course, uh, every every um, if we multiply this by two, so if we take six two, then we get an arrow twice as long, but it represents the same direction. Um, not sure why this is in the lecture, but this is the formula for the norm. It might come up later. Uh, so it's a formula for the length of, the, of this vector, the length of this arrow. Um, and just to reiterate, if you have a, a linear function, uh, you basically get multiple, multiple of these slopes. So if you have a function for a, uh, for a hyperplane, or a plane in this case, consists of these parameters, and these values are your slopes. 
so the uh, equivalent of finding the derivative, which I'll, for the moment I'll assume you all know how to do. If you don't, again, please have a look at the homework <coughs> and then review this lecture. But for the moment, I'll assume you know how to take a derivative. So we'll talk about how to generalize that to multiple dimensions. We have a vector of multiple values. So a, a, a 3D vector, uh, uh, sorry, we have a function of multiple, <coughs> multiple values. A 3D vector goes into the function. Uh, the equivalent of taking the derivative is uh, computing the gradient, which is another vector, which basically consists of the partial, uh, partial derivative with respect to x, the partial derivative with respect to y, and the partial derivative with respect to z. And that vector of these three values together <coughs> defines three uh, parameters for a plane, and these three values together define your hyperplane. Uh, in this case, it's a 3D hyperplane, so the picture doesn't exactly match because it's a 2D plane in the picture. <coughs> so that's your gradient. Um, it's just the three different ways of taking a derivative of this uh, multivalued function. So what you get if you take the derivative, you, take, uh, you get uh, this, uh, this w, and this then becomes the um, function describing this tangent hyperplane. So now that we have this tangent hyperplane, all we have to know is in which direction does the, does the hyperplane go up or down the quickest, and that will become the direction in which we want to take a step. So what we want to know is given this function, for a hyperplane, <coughs> what's the direction of steepest descent? Which is a bit of a, a technical distinction, so we're looking for the direction in which it increases the quickest, because that's easier to work out. And then the step we actually want to take is just the opposite of that. Uh, and here we have to look at this alternative uh, formulation of the dot product again. So this is just rewriting the dot product into this. So we take these two uh, vectors here, and their dot product is equivalent to the product of their lengths, for which we saw the formula earlier, times the, ang uh, the cosine of the angle between them. So just take that as given. <coughs> uh, and I have to look at my notes here a little bit to uh, <coughs> do this properly, explain this properly. So what we're looking for is the uh, direction x in which uh, this function increases the quickest. Oh, sorry. Um, so essentially what we can say, well, that uh, since we're only interested in the direction, let's say the uh, length of x is 1. So we're looking at all the x's that have the same length, basically a circle around 0. Uh, so we know that this becomes 1. So then the question is, for which w um, is this value, uh, is, is, uh, is the norm of w times the cosine of a the biggest? And that is um, <coughs> let me say this properly. So we're maximizing the quantity, the norm uh, w, times the cosine of a. And a only depends on the choice of input, because w is given. Uh, so the cosine of a is maximal when a is 0. There we go, that's what I forgot. Um, so we want to maximize this value. This bit is 1. So this becomes 1 when alpha is 0, <coughs> which means the distance between x and w needs to be, the angle, sorry, between x and w needs to be zero, which means that x and w are the same. So to make a long story short, if uh, w is equal to x in direction, um, then this value is maximized. So to go all the way back to the beginning, to the original question that we asked, we wanted to know what's the direction of steepest descent it's just W. 
So once we've worked out this gradient, the gradient is actually the direction in which the function increases the quickest. That's all <clears throat> that was about. So this gives us a very simple algorithm. All of that was just to describe this two-line, three-line algorithm. We start with a random pointy model space. We compute the gradient of the loss at that point. We multiply that by a small value eta, which is a parameter of the algorithm. We have to choose that. And then we subtract that from the model. So there's no random randomness, no random steps, no randomization. We just compute this gradient and we take a step in the direction of the gradient. It's a purely deterministic algorithm, apart from picking a random point here at the top. And then our step size, <coughs> we have to choose. Well, we have to choose this multiplier, but note that the gradient gives us both a direction and a step size. So hopefully as we get towards this minimum, the gradient will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So here's what that looks like. No, sorry, uh, I'm just showing a picture of the loss landscape again, just to remind you what we're doing. This is our loss landscape. We're now going to work out the gradient for this loss landscape. <coughs> so we have our loss function, w of the function of w and b. Squares of these residuals sum them, take the mean. And what we're interested in is the gradient of this loss function, which is a two-dimensional uh, vector with the derivative of the loss function with respect to w and the derivative of the loss function with respect to b. And that's what we're going to work out. Uh, so here comes a little bit of calculus. So the loss function, uh, derivative of the loss function with respect to w, looks like this. Uh, and there's a couple of simple rules for how to take derivatives. The first is that the derivative, uh, so we're doing two steps once. First is that a constant multiplier you can take out, the, out of the derivative. So you can just uh, basically move this out of the derivative. The derivative of this whole thing is the same if we move this outside of the derivative. And then the derivative of a sum is the same of this as the sum of all its individual terms. Sorry, the derivative of a sum is the same as the sum of all the individual derivatives, which basically means that we can do this. So we can just sum the derivatives of all these terms with respect to w, and that's the same thing. It's the sum rule of taking the derivative. Um, so now we need to get rid of this square, uh, which we can do by the uh, chain rule, which is basically s tells us that the derivative uh, of a composite function, we take the uh, derivative of each element with respect to its argument and multiply them. So we take the derivative of this whole thing with respect, uh, sorry, the derivative of the square uh, with respect to the thing we're squaring, and we multiply it by that thing we're squaring, and we uh, multiply it by the derivative of the thing we're squaring with respect to w. That's the chain rule. Um, so this one we can work out. This is just the exponent rule, so this... Um, square that we're taking here moves out in front, and that's just a der derivative of um, something squared, uh, which we've moved out of the sum immediately and moved here to the top of this uh, fraction. So we end up with just this argument, and then this derivative on the right, here we finally start to see this w. So it's uh, three terms. Uh, the last two terms don't have w in them, so the derivative becomes zero. So we can forget about this. So we end up with just the derivative of w times x with respect to w, which is just x. So this whole thing uh, becomes just xi. And that's our uh, one part of our gradient. That's the uh, first element of our gradient. Second element of our gradient works in much the same way. So most of the steps are the same. We apply the chain rule again, except here in this part, we're taking the derivative with respect to b instead of w. So the first and the last term disappear, and we just get 
uh, drift of B over drift of B, uh, which is just one. So it becomes a little bit more simple. So our gradient, uh, these two functions become these two functions. And then for any, uh, we can implement those in Python. And for any point in our model space, we can compute the gradient. We can compute this vector and take a step in the direction of the vector, which looks like this. So as I said, no more randomness. It goes immediately, follows the curvature of the loss surface, and goes for the minimum uh, and stays there. Uh, so if this is a little bit mysterious to you, I uh, sympathize. And one good thing you can do is to uh, play around with this website called playground.tensorflow.org, um, which we will uh, see a few times, uh, we'll come back to a few times. So this is, if you just go to this URL that I've typed here, you'll see quite a complicated interface, but the nice thing about it is that it allows you to turn things off. So I've turned almost everything off, and this just allows you to play around with just the things we've talked about today. So I think if I click here, it should open a browser. So let's see what we have here. Basically, this is our model. It gets, uh, it's pretty much the same as what, we, uh, what we've been doing so far. So we have two inputs. We have two inputs, x1 and x2. And we have a data set here, which is linearly separable. Uh, sorry, not linearly separable. We're doing regression. So it's, uh, uh, what you see here is the, the very blue points have the value 1, and the very orange points have the value 0, and the mixture has something in between. Um, and we're just learning this kind of linear model using gradient descent. And let's, I think it's initialized on quite a good model, so let's initialize it on a randomly so we get a slightly worse model there. So what you see is that the, uh, this, the gradient here different word for it. So this uh, color transition here indicates the slope of the plane. So we have a plane that slopes like that at the moment. And the ideal plane sort of slopes like that from the bottom uh, left-hand corner to the top right corner. Uh, and we can see set here the uh, learning rate, which is at well, set it a little bit lower. So that it, oh, sorry, works more slowly. And then we can start it. And you can say, see that it pretty much immediately turns around this plane and fits the uh, plane to the data. And that's basically what we've been doing. That's gradient descent. That's what it looks like uh, in this uh, playground.tensorflow.org. So we'll come back to this. Uh, more as we're adding, as we're discussing more interesting stuff, we'll come back to it uh, more and more and add features to this uh, playground uh, tool. Uh, oh yeah, here's what it looks like in model space. So you can see that it's, uh, it looks like a sort of 80s synth music uh, cover almost. You get this sort of gradient that slowly and very deterministically steps towards the optimal solution. Um, what we don't get with gradient descent is a way to escape local minima. In fact, quite the opposite. It's very deterministic. So given your starting position, where you end up is always fixed. And it may well be a local minimum. It's not always a problem. Uh, but sometimes it is. And then you need to try a few starting points before you get to the uh, local minimum. Another problem is that you have to pick this learning rate. So gradient descent gives you the magnitude of the step size you want to take, but you still want to scale that uh, to fit your learning problem. So if you set the learning rate too high, you sort of, in this ball that you're trying to explore, you jump from one side to the other. You're jumping back and forth from different sides to the ball, uh, which you don't want. You want to sort of slowly, like a marble rolling down the ball. You want to find the center. 
So if you reduce the learning rate a little bit, it gets a little bit better, and uh, 0.01 is pretty much uh, optimal for this, uh, for this problem. And what you see at uh, 0. Point, if you go one step lower, you see that it still finds the minimum, but it takes a lot more steps. So this is what you want to find when you're tuning your learning rate, something that doesn't jump all over the place and uh, doesn't find your, your minimum. But on the other hand, you want to set it big enough that you don't want to, you don't have to wait ages and ages for your search algorithm to finish. Um, so that's gradient descent, which is a very helpful uh, algorithm. One point I should make, since we're actually talking about linear metho methods, one other thing you can do uh, on pen, uh, with pen and paper is just take the loss and set it equal to zero. Uh, to, uh, sorry, take the, both of these two derivatives and set both of them equal to zero and work out the resulting formula symbolically. Sometimes you can do that. With linear functions, I think it's part of the second homework. You can actually do this and just work out your optimal model. You don't have to search at all. All this uh, stuff about searching is, for linear models, is completely irrelevant because you can just work out what your optimal model is. The reason I didn't tell you about that so far and spent a lot of time talking about uh, search is that almost all of the time we don't want linear models, we want more complex models. And then you cannot, well, you can set it equal to zero, but you cannot work out the values of these parameters anymore. And then you have to use gradient descent. Uh, so for some functions, like linear functions, this, you, know, you can actually do this. But as your model complexity grows, uh, that op uh, option disappears pretty quickly. So gradient descent, uh, just to summarize. A uh, few drawbacks, it only works for continuous model spaces with smooth loss functions for which we can work out the gradient, what, like, what I call differentiable functions earlier. And it doesn't escape local minima. But it is very fast and very low memory and very accurate. And for these reasons, it's the backbone of most of modern machine learning. So it's very important, and we're going to come back to it often. Which brings us to the uh, final subject, classification. I uh, hope I have left enough time for this. So now we have a similar problem, but we have a different uh, abstract task. Namely, we want to, so we, we want to f uh, separate blue points from red points in this space, and we want to find a line that does so optimally. Uh, the first question is, again, notation. How do we define this, li oh, the, the, this line in feature space. Um, and the simplest, most straightforward way to do that is to say um, we uh, define this linear function over feature space, same way we did with the regression. And we call the point where that plane that we're defining now crosses the feature space, the, sorry, the, the intersection with that plane and the feature space becomes a line. So where that, uh, that plane is equal to zero, that becomes a line in our feature space. And we use that line as our classification boundary. So you get this plane. Uh, let's look at it in one dimension first. So this is our one-dimensional feature space. We draw a line on top of that, giving us some value y that we're not actually that interested in. And we say wherever that line is positive, we're going to call it a red point, and wherever that line is negative, we're going to call it a blue point. And our decision boundary is then just this dot here. And in two dimensions, that looks like this. So we have this plane again, defined by this linear function that we've already seen in regression. Uh, and at some point, that plane crosses the, the zero um, plane. which gives us a line in the feature space, and where the line is positive, where the sorry, plane of our model is positive, we call it blue, I've switched it around, sorry. In this case, we call it blue, where it's positive, and we call it red, where it's negative. Uh, and you can tell, and this is the, the sort of direction of steepest descent again. So the gradient actually points at, an, uh, at a straight angle away from this uh, decision boundary. So you have this decision boundary 
at a right angle from that points the gradient, and the gradient points towards the positive class, which is blue in this case. Uh, and remember, this is just the gradient. W is just the gradient. Uh, all right. So let's look at some example data, very simple example classification set. Just six instances, three blue ones, three red ones. And we're going to find a uh, classifier for this data set. So same basic recipe, same basic ingredients. We need to search the space of possible planes, of possible linear models. And we need to do that, uh, we need a loss function. So that we need to apply a loss function to that space, and we need to search for where that loss function is uh, the smallest. So here we run into an interesting problem. What loss function should we use for classification? Any thoughts? What makes a good model in classification? So if you have this data set, oops, sorry. Well, that's a little bit advanced for <laughs> what we're doing at the moment. A base theorem was one of the... Uh, no, so it's, it's much more simple. One thing you can do, and it's, in a way it's good that you didn't say it because it's a trick question, but one thing you can do is just to look at this line that you've drawn, draw some line here, and look at, un given that line, how many points do we misclassify? So if I draw a line here, I get two points wrong. Get this point wrong and this point wrong. So that's a value you can assign to a model, and that's a value that you're interested in. That's what you want to be as low as possible, the number of points you misclassify, which is called the error. So that's one thing we can do. So let's try that. Loss function, number of points misclassified. Let's see what the loss surface looks like then. Uh, I'm slightly cheating here because our model actually has three parameters. So uh, we're not looking at the, th the second parameter. I forget how I did it exactly, but um, normalizing that away. Uh, but let's just imagine our model has two parameters. The loss function looks something like this. So at first sight, this might not be so bad. You have a black regions where you don't want to end up and a white region where you do want to end up. Um, but what happens if you start doing, let's say, Start simple, let's uh, start with random search. What happens if you do random search here? You start here, and you take a small step. Until you get anywhere near this space, you're basically doing a random walk. Because in all directions, you get this flat surface. Nothing about this surface tells you where to go at all. So you're just walking around randomly until you're lucky enough to stumble here. And then you're walking around randomly in this space until you're lucky enough to get into this space, and so on. So random search is going to take a long time to find anything. And gradient descent is even worse, because the gradient in this whole area is zero everywhere. It's this flat structure. So gradient descent is just going to tell you to stay put. Basically, this whole space is an optimum under gradient descent, except for these boundaries here, where the gradient is undefined. So gradient descent will either crash or tell you not to move. In other words, this loss surface, even though it's what we're interested in, even though it's the, the, the thing we want to minimize, it really doesn't tell you anything about where to go. So, to uh, put it on a tile, sometimes your loss function should not be the same as your evaluation function. So your evaluation function in this case is how you're evaluating a, a finished model by how many points it misclassifies. But searching for a model that actually gives you a good evaluation, you require a slightly different loss function. So what we're looking for is a loss function that has its minimum at about this point, or close to this point, but one that is smooth everywhere, so we can differentiate it. Uh, the uh, in the run of this course, we will three see three examples. These get ki quite complicated. Uh, so uh, for logistic regression, we will need a little bit of probability to define this loss function. That happens in week three. And for the SVM loss, we don't need probability, but we need a little bit of uh, 
Uh, I need a little bit of time to explain that, so that will also happen in week three. And for now, we'll just look at a slightly worse one, which normally you wouldn't use. Normally you would use one of these guys, but we'll just use it a look at a simple one uh, to sort of round off the lecture, which is just basically this least squares principle that we saw for regression applied to uh, classification. And all we do really <coughs> is we take these, uh, these points we had earlier and we assign them a value and then we just treat it as a regression problem. So we just assign the red points value minus one, and we assign the blue points value uh, plus one, and then we just treat it like a regression problem. So we say this line should predict one for all of these points, and it should predict zero for all of these points, and minimize the residuals and see how close you get. Which is a bit weird because it clearly the points don't form a line, they form two lines. Uh, but it still works pretty well because it pulls a line here into this cluster of uh, blue points and pulls the line here into this cluster of red points. And if your points are, uh, if these clusters of points are far enough apart, then the point where the line crosses the uh, the origin will probably separate the two classes pretty well. So this is not a great loss function, but it is differentiable at the very least. So we can have a look at what the loss surface looks like. It looks like this, so it's nice and smooth. Easy to do gradient descent here. Uh, and broadly, the best model, at least in this case, is in the same place as it was for the uh, number of misclassifications loss function. So this is what the gradient descent looks like. <coughs> uh, and here's what it looks like in the feature space. So again, you see that it uh, takes these very neat deterministic steps and slowly converges to a final model, which in this case happens to have a misclassification rate of zero. So none of the points in our training data are misclassified under the best model, happily. That's not guaranteed. If you're uh, with this least squares loss function, <coughs> there's no guarantee that if your data is linearly separable, that it actually finds that linear separation. Uh, for that, you need the logistic regression or the SVM loss that we'll talk about later. This one, too, you can uh, tr play around with in TensorFlow, uh, it, in playground.tensorflow.org. Uh, so here we have the same thing, but now as a classification problem. Here is our two inputs. We have a data set. Let's start with a data set that is linearly separable. So we have some blue points and some or orange points. And it starts with a random, uh, random model. So let's again pick an initialization that is not actually a good model. There we go. So this is a, we have our orange points and our blue points here. And we have the classifier that says everything here is uh, uh, we're going to call orange and everything here we're going to call blue, so it's not a very good classifier at the moment because we've initialized it randomly. Uh, set the learning rate low so we can see what happens. And of course this doesn't actually use least squares loss, it uses one of these other loss functions, but otherwise uh, the principle is the same. And as you can see it's very slow now because I've set the learning rate uh, very low. Uh, so we can see what's happening, but you can see that it's slowly covering more and more of the orange points uh, with the orange part and more and more of the blue points with the blue part. Maybe I set the learning rate slightly too slow. See if we can speed it up a little bit. Oh, it's too much. Uh, and what you see I think, is that it converged? Yeah, it's converged. So you see that the <coughs> I've added some noise. So the point clouds are not entirely linearly separable. It gets a couple of them wrong. But by and large, it finds a good uh, solution. And what we can do now is look at the weakness of linear models, namely that it's a very constrained model space. It can't express that many things. For instance, something called a XOR dataset where you get these four squares. 
where all the numbers where both x1 uh, and x2 uh, are, uh, if x1 and x2 are both positive, we color it blue. If they are both negative, we color it blue as well. And if one of them is positive and the other is negative, we color it orange. So you get this kind of, uh, oh, sorry, this square this uh, separation of your feature space. And that data set is not linearly separable at all, right? There's not a line that you can draw here that separates the blues from the oranges. And what we see is if we apply gradient descent to that, that it really doesn't know what to do very well. Uh, it sort of hovers around the middle where it gets 50% wrong. Sometimes the line just disappears entirely and it just makes everything blue. So basically, if we r run into this kind of data set, we're screwed with a linear model. We're, not, we're never ever going to get a good performance from a linear model. Same for the other data set. So here we have uh, a circle. So we have a small cluster of blue points and a cluster of orange points around it. And again, there's no way to linearly separate these. So the search just sort of sticks around, doesn't really do anything, sort of cuts the feature space in two. But really, no line you draw is going to be any better or worse than any other line here. And finally, the most difficult of the data sets in this playground thing, this is a, sort of a spiral. The red and the blue, the orange and the blue class are sort of spiraled into each, each other. Uh, which is very challenging for any classifier, but the linear classifier has absolutely no starting point. Uh, so it's a good question, why do we bother with these linear classifiers at all? Well, one thing is that if, you've, uh, if your feature space is very high dimensional, so think of these images, for instance, that we talked about, where you had 784 features, then usually you're quite likely to get some good linear separability. So if you have a very high dimensional feature space, linear classifiers can work pretty well, and they're very cheap. So in that case, it might be a good choice. Another thing you can do if you don't have a high dimensional feature space is you can blow up your feature space by adding extra features, deriving new features from the features you already had. And that's something we're going to talk about next week. Um, and I think the next slide is a summary. So just reviewing what we've talked about. Um, we saw these uh, black box optimization methods, which are very randomized. Um, and the benefit there was that you really only need to be able to evaluate your loss function. And then you can find a model. So it's very easy, very easy to implement and very easy to search. If you're uh, willing to look into your model a little bit more and do a little bit of calculus, you can use gradient descent, which is very powerful and converges much faster and much more controllably. But you're stuck there with continuous model spaces. Uh, and as I've said many times, we'll come back to this again and again. And then if you want to apply this kind of thing for, to classification, especially if you want to apply gradient descent to classification, you need to find a smooth loss function as a proxy for this discrete uh, loss function that we want to use but we can't use because no search method works on this discrete loss uh, curve. And least squares loss is one very bad uh, way of doing it and we're going to see some good ways of doing it in the coming weeks. And that's all I had for you today. So thank you very much for attending and I'll see you next Monday when we'll talk about machine learning methodology. <laughs>